we created a player, we have our game world, and we added dangerous creatures of the night. It's time to add some interactions and special moves. Today we will learn an easy way how to handle collision detection, and we will resolve collision between player and enemies in two different ways, depending on the current player state. If the player is rolling, enemies are destroyed and we get score points. In any other state, it's the player who receives a hit. We will also add dust particles and fire trail. If you followed any of my other creative courses, you can also use those animated trails and use them here, like you see in this demo. I like to combine game dev and creative coding. With JavaScript and HTML canvas, it's all the same set of techniques. Let's go! We have player and enemies in our game. We want them to be able to interact in different ways with each other. Let's apply collision detection. First, I want to draw a rectangle around the player and around each enemy to see their collision areas, so-called hitboxes. I go to input.js file and I delete these console logs. I want our game to have a debug mode. When I press letter D on my keyboard, we enable debug mode and collision hitboxes will be drawn. When we press D again, we exit debug mode and hitboxes will be hidden. It's very simple to implement. In keydown event, I create an else if statement. If e.key is D, set debug property on the main game object to its opposite value. If it's currently true, set it to false. If it's false, set it to true. In main.js I create this.debug property on game class and initially I set it to true. In draw method on player class, before I draw the player sprite sheet, I say if this.game.debug is true, draw a rectangle around the player. This rectangle will be exactly the size of player's hitbox, so from this.x, this.y, player's coordinates, to player's width and height, like this. Now I can go back to input.js. Here we are toggling debug mode on and off by pressing letter D. For this to work, I need to bring a reference to the main game object here. I pass game object as an argument to the class constructor and I convert it to a class property. From here we can point to the game object and toggle debug mode on and off. Finally we know that input handler class expects game as an argument. So here on the main game class I pass it this as an argument. Now, when I press letter D on my keyboard, we are toggling debug mode on and off. Perfect. I can also create hitboxes around enemies. Inside the draw method on enemy class, I say if this.game.debug is true, stroke rectangle around the enemy. Like this. This will work. Reference to the game object is not on the main parent enemy class, but we have it down here on each enemy type separately. Our game now has a debug mode. You can toggle it on and off by pressing D. These hitboxes represent collision areas. When the player hitbox touches any of the enemy hitboxes, I want them to interact in some way. We can have multiple different interactions. Today I will show you how to have two different interactions. When the player collides with an enemy while in rolling state, it will destroy that enemy and we get some score points. If the player is not rolling, it will get hit and it will stop its movement for a moment and play dizzy animation from our sprite sheet. We will use a simple collision detection formula between two rectangles to check if player and enemies interact. Here inside the player class I create a new helper method I call for example check collisions. Inside we will cycle through enemies array that holds all currently active enemy objects and as we cycle through them one by one we will compare their x, y width and height to the current x, y width and height of the player object. So this.game.enemies.foreach and for each enemy object I will run the following callback function. We will have a simple if-else statement, if some conditions are met, collision is detected, else there is no collision. To check if two rectangles collide, which means they touch or they overlap, we have to compare their x, y width and height. Keep in mind that the way images our sprite sheets are drawn on canvas, we go from their x and y coordinates from the top left corner of the image to their width and height, like this. So now, player's current horizontal x position is here and vertical y position is here, for example. We need to check if x coordinate of this enemy is less than x coordinate of the player plus player width. If this point is less or to the left on the horizontal x axis from this point. At the same time, we check if x coordinate of the enemy plus the width of the enemy is more than the current x coordinate of the player, if this point is to the right of this point. If these two conditions are true, we know that the player and enemy are colliding horizontally. We still don't know if they collide because they could be far away from each other vertically. 
we will need two more checks here. We check if the enemy's current vertical Y position is less than vertical position of the player plus player's height. We check if this point is above this point. And finally we check if enemy's Y position plus its height is more than Y position of the player if this point is below this point. Only if all four of these conditions are true, player and enemy are colliding. Even if one of these is false, this entire if statement will evaluate to false and we know there is no collision. If we collide, we will set marked for deletion property on that enemy object to true. I will also add one more score point, so this.game.score++. I save changes and in main.js I need to create this.score property and initially I set it to zero. Now I go back to player.js, I take our new check collisions method and I will be constantly calling it over and over from up here inside the update method, like this. And we have interactions in our game. Whenever the player hitbox touches a hitbox of any enemy, that enemy gets deleted. Perfect. Whenever we destroy an enemy, we are also increasing our score, but we can't see it yet. Let's create some UI elements. I create a new file called UIJS. Inside I create a custom class I call for example UI and I will be exporting it. Be careful about lowercase and uppercase letters with the word UI. Make sure you spell it the same across our codebase. Constructor will need a reference to the main game object because that's where the current score value is stored. I create a property called font size and I set it to 30 pixels for example. Font family will be Helvetica. You can also use any Google fonts here. Just link them in index.html and use their font family name here if you want to. It will work. This UI class will have just one method I call for example draw. Its job will be to draw all UI elements and game statuses that we need. First I declare some basic settings. Context.font will be this.fontSize plus pixels space plus this.fontFamily. In this part we will declare code that's specific to draw in score. Up here some more global settings. Text align will be left and fill style for all fonts will be kept on the main game object in case we need to draw fonts from some other modules as well. This.game.fontColor. It doesn't exist yet so I declare it here on line 27 in main.js file. To draw score I call built-in fill text method and I pass it some text we want to draw so score colon space plus this.game.score. That's a variable from line 26 in main.js. And I want it to be drawn at coordinates 20, 50. We are exporting our new UI class up here so we can import it to main.js like this. I will instantiate UI class inside game class constructor as usual and I pass it the reference to the main game object, so this keyword. Inside the draw method on game class I take this.ui property that holds an instance of our new UI class. Be careful about capital letters here. And I call its draw method and I pass it context. Perfect. We are drawing score and it's increasing as we collide with enemies. So this is how I like to handle drawing game text and statuses. If we want to display more information to the user, we can just add more code inside the draw method on our new UI class. We are keeping our code modular and organized today. It's easy to expand it later. I want to add more player states. We will have two different attacks and a separate state that will play dizzy animation when the player gets hit by an enemy. Let's go ahead and add them up here inside player states.js into our enum object that holds key value pairs and it assigns each state number a more human readable value. We will have rolling state with index 4, diving state with index 5 and hit state with index 6 for when the player gets hit. I copy this entire code block and I rename it to rolling. I will also put rolling in all caps here. I check my sprite sheet and I can see that rolling animation is on the row 6, counting from 0, so frame Y is 6. I want player to start rolling when we press enter and I want it to keep rolling as long as enter key is pressed down. Inside handle input we deal with switching states. We only want to switch player to a different state when enter is not pressed anymore. So if input doesn't include enter and at the same time if player is currently on ground, we can exit rolling state and switch the player into running state. Else if input doesn't include enter and player is not on ground, 
If we stopped rolling in the air, switch into the falling state like this. We have our rolling state. Now we can decide from which states we will allow the player to enter rolling. In this case I will allow it from all states, because player can start rolling anytime. Inside handle input method on sitting class I say else if input includes enter, set state to rolling and pass it speed of 2. Rolling will increase the scrolling speed of our game compared to the regular running speed. I take this else statement and I paste it down here inside running class. We can also start rolling when we are running. I do the same in jumping class. We can also start rolling while we are in the middle of a jump. For now I will not allow player to start rolling while it's fallen. Let's see how that feels. We can always add it later. So now we have rolling with a value of 4 up here inside our enum and we are exporting rolling class on line 94. On line 1 in player.js I import rolling and I create an instance of it inside this.states array on line 21. I get an error. It's because I didn't save changes I made to player states.js. VS Code Editor indicates that you have unsaved changes in a file with this little icon here. I go in, I save it and now I can press enter and I can roll around. Nice work! I can start rolling from running state, from sitting state and from jumping state. I'm testing my gameplay and I feel like I would like to start jumping while I'm rolling on the ground like this, but the game won't allow me to do that. I can't enter jump while rolling on the ground because we didn't write that behavior. Let's do it. In handle input method on rolling class I say if input includes enter, which means we are rolling, and if input also includes arrow up at the same time, remember that our input keys array can hold multiple keys at the same time, if enter and arrow up are pressed at the same time, and if we are rolling on the ground at that moment, so this dot player on ground is true, we will push player up in the negative direction on the vertical y axis. This dot player velocity y minus equals 27. Now I can roll around and I can jump up and down like this. This feels much better to play. This is a superhero dog. I want the controls and movement to feel good and quick. This dog can roll and jump around freely and the controls are very precise. Time to add some particle effects. We will have three different particle types in this game. Dust that comes from the ground at player's feet when it runs on solid ground, blazing fire trail when the player is rolling and diving, and a big splash of particles when we dive and stomp into the ground. I create a new file I call for example particles.js. Inside we will have the main parent class called particle. I will not be exporting it, it will just contain properties and methods shared between all three particle types. Constructor will need a reference to the main game object. Marked for deletion will be false at first. Update method will also have some code shared between all particle types. Horizontal x coordinate will decrease by the amount of speed x and game speed like this. Vertical y coordinate will be affected by speed y property. For every frame the size of each particle will decrease by 5%. When size is less than 0.5 pixels, the particle is small enough and we will set its marked for deletion property to true. Values like speed x and size don't exist yet. I didn't declare them on the main particle class because they will have different values for each particle type. We need to make sure we define them on the child classes because if JavaScript can't find these properties when update method runs we will get an error. So child class I call dust extends parent particle class. We will be exporting it. We will also have splash particles for when we hit the ground at high speed and fire particles for the attack animations. I start with the dust class. Constructor will need a reference to the main game object and x and y coordinates because the location of the particle will depend on the player's current position. We want them to appear under the player as it moves around. I call super and pass this game along because it's expected up here. This will trigger class constructor on the parent particle class activating all shared properties. Size of dust particles will be a random number between 10 and 20. X coordinate will be x that is passed as an argument. Same goes for the y coordinate. Horizontal speed x will be a random number between 0 and 1. Vertical speed y is also a random number between 0 and 1. Color will be black. Draw method will take context as an argument as usual. I want to draw dust particles as circles, so we start with begin path. We create an arc, add coordinates this.x, this.y. 
With a radius of this dot size, start angle will be zero and angle is mathed by times two, so full circle. We set fill style to this dot color and we fill the path with black color. We are exporting dust, so I will import it up here on line one in player states JS. Since we are using state design pattern, it makes sense we control particles from here as well, because they will be closely tied to player states. I have a problem now, if I want to handle particles from here this way, I need access to the main game object. When I initially built this state management code, I thought I would only need access to the player class, but we need to go one level up and access the game object. This is why it's good to plan your code bases well before you start writing the code. I will have to do a little bit of refactoring here to make sure we have access to the main game class from within each individual player state class. Here on line 14 I pass the main state parent class a second argument called game and inside I convert it to class property this.game equals game. I want to replace all references to the player object with references to the game object. Game object contains the player so I will still have access to the player object from there. Constructor on the sitting class will expect game as an argument. We delete this line with player. I pass that game object reference along to the parent class constructor as a second argument, because I know it's expected here on line 14. It will get converted to this.game class property. Now if I want to access player in these five places, I need to say this.game.player. In VS Code you can highlight a portion of text and hold Ctrl key down, then whenever you tap letter D, it will highlight another occurrence of that text. Using this you can select multiple lines at the same time. I tap D four times to select all five occurrences of this text and that gives me multi-cursor selection. I can use left and right arrows to move around and I just type game dot. I do the same in the running class. I pass it game, I remove this player line and I pass game as the second argument to the superclass constructor. Then I select one, two, three, four, five, six and I need this.game.player here in all these places. I do the same in jumping class, refactoring. Sorry, I should have planned this part better, we are almost done. I replace all nine occurrences of this.player here with this.game.player. Falling class doesn't have much code, so this one is easy. And rolling class is the last one we need to refactor. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and this.game.player. If I save this, it will break our code because our state classes are expecting game as an argument now. So on line 21 in player.js, we are currently passing this keyword, which means player object. I need to pass this.game from line five instead to all of them. Now we are getting some new errors and that's because I'm passing game object as an argument and immediately I'm triggering that state class and its enter method. But at this point the game object is not yet completely loaded so the initial state is failing. I need to cut these two lines of code and I only want to run them when the rest of the game object is ready. So at the end here. When everything is ready including game class, player class and all state classes, we take current state property on player class and we set it to states zero, sitting state. And we trigger enter method on the sitting state. We refactored our code and now everything is working again. We are well positioned to start adding particles through our state classes. We have a lot of console logs here. I press Ctrl F and I search for console. I delete this one on line 61 in main.js and this one on line 65. We also have a console log on line 57 in player.js. I delete it. Debugging is better with a clean console. So we are exporting dust class here and we are importing it up here in player states.js. I will hold all currently active particles in an array on the main game object. So I created here. This dot particles will be an empty array at first. Back to player states.js. I only want to add dust when the player is running. So inside handle input method on running state that runs 60 times per second, I will be pushing one new particle in every time it runs. This.game.particles.push 
and I pass it new dust. On line 14 in Particles.js I can see that the dust class constructor expects game x and y as arguments, so I pass it this.game from line 16. I will also be passing the current x and y coordinates of the player, because I want the new particles to appear at player's current position. I close some of these JavaScript files for now, to keep our workplace clean. Inside update method on the game class, after this block that handles enemies, we write our code to handle particles. On line 25 we have this.particles array that holds all currently active particle objects. We are pushing new dust particles in here from inside running state class. I take that array and I call for each. For each particle in the array I will call their update method. If particle is small enough and its marked for deletion property has been set to true, we call splice method to remove it. Splice method will need index of the particle we want to remove and how many elements to remove starting from that index. For each method passes auto generated index argument, so I can just assign it to a variable name here. I call it for example index and I pass it to splice to identify the particle to remove, and I want to remove one element at this index. So here we call update on all active particles and we delete old ones. Inside the draw method I will cycle through all the particles again and I will call draw method. One optimization tip here would be not to cycle through the same array once in update and once in draw method. I can for example have a utility handle particles function that does all of that. There are many ways to refactor this code, we might do it later. For now this code will work well. You can see we are drawing our dust particles from the top left corner of the player hitbox only when we are in a running state. Nice. I will console log this.particles array to check if old particles are being correctly removed. We don't want to have an endlessly growing array in our project. That would become a performance problem soon. In console I can see that particles go up to 50 or 60 and when we stop running the array is getting smaller and smaller until it's empty again. Perfect. I want the dust particles to come from a different point relative to the player. I adjust horizontal x coordinate by the half of player's width like this. I will also adjust vertical y coordinate by player's height, pushing the particle's initial coordinates down closer to the game level ground. You can see how well this works in combination with state design pattern. We are only adding new particles when in running state, when player's feet are moving and touching the ground. I can go to my dust class and play with properties of the dust. I can make the particles different shape or size here if I want to. I can also give them a different color. Red, blue. It will all work. I can also do a semi-transparent color using RGBA color declaration, like this. I'm happy with this, but feel free to play with the code and adjust these effects. I came up with two different versions to animate fire for this game. I showed you both versions. This is the version with SVG filters, where we are blurring and sharpening particles to create this liquid smoke effect. I use this a lot in my generative art videos. You could actually look at any of my creative coding videos where we build trails and use that code to give your player a unique trail effect. It will be compatible with everything. Today I will do something I haven't showed you how to do before. I will use a particle image. It will be this simple flame texture. Canvas is very good and efficient at drawing images. Drawing a rectangle or an image are often two most performance efficient options for an effect like this, from my experience. You can download the fire texture in the video description. The texture is big, I will probably make the image smaller before I give it to you for download. You can also color shift the image in Photoshop to create blue or red fire trail, if it fits your level art assets. I set its display to none with CSS. We will use this image here for our fire class. Constructor will expect game, x and y as arguments. This dot image will be this fire texture image. I gave it an ID of fire. Size will be a random value between 50 and 150 pixels. X will be passed as an argument and same goes for y. Horizontal speed will be 1 pixel per frame and vertical speed will also be 1 pixel. We have update method on the parent particle class. I will first call the code from here, so update, super, update like this. Draw method will take context as an argument and it will call draw image. I pass it this.image from line 39, this.x, this.y, this.size as width and this.size as height. 
Nice, so this is our fire class. We are exporting it, so I can import it on line 1 in player states.js. I can copy this line of code from running class that is adding new dust particles. I paste it inside handle input method on rolling class and instead of dust I instantiate the new fire class we just wrote. Now when I roll I'm getting a trail of fire. I adjust these properties a bit. Before we fix the position of our fire trail, let's make the individual fire texture images rotate. I will need two helper variables called this.angle, which will start at zero, and this.va, velocity of angle. It will be a random value between minus 0.1 and plus 0.1. In a side update method, I will increase angle by VA for every animation frame. We will be rotating, so to make sure the rotations don't overflow to other elements and only affect this fire particle, I will wrap this code between save and restore. This will make sure all canvas settings I declare in between will only affect this one particle. To rotate anything on canvas, first we have to translate rotation center point from its default position at coordinate 0, 0 in the top left corner of canvas over the center of the item we want to rotate. So I will translate to this.x and this.y of this fire particle. That particle is a rectangular image, so I'm translating to its top left corner. Then I call built-in rotate method that takes angle value in radians and it will rotate everything that's drawn after this call unless we restore canvas again to its original default state. If I roll now we are getting a spiral of small fire particles in a big circle around the player. It's because we are translating to this.x this.y and from that point we are drawing again to the distance of this.x this.y here. I fix that by setting this to 0, 0 because position of particle on canvas is already defined in translate method here. Translate method moves rotation center point and what is considered coordinate 0, 0 on canvas to the coordinates we pass to it. So because of this translate call, for these particles coordinate 0, 0 on canvas are here in this area. I'm translating to the top left corner of each fire image of each particle rectangle. I want to center it so I adjust this value by half of its width and this one by the half of its height. Canvas rotation can be difficult for beginners but we just covered all of it. I have more detailed lessons on this topic but for now let's just move on. I can increase the size of fire particles here on line 40. I can also give them some horizontal wobble using the same technique we used for flying enemies. For each frame I increase x by a sign value of ever increasing angle and it will map horizontal x positions along an endless sine wave shape. If you are a beginner all you have to understand about this is that if you pass math.sign an ever increasing angle value, our angle is increasing here on line 50, it will map positions along a wavy path. If you look at the particles now there is some left right wavy movement. I can also make the particles shrink slower by adjusting this value. This will result in a longer fire trail as particles take longer to be small enough to be removed. I can make the rotation faster or slower by adjusting this range of values. I can increase particle size. I can make them shrink faster. In main.js I remove this console log on line 53. I want to make sure we don't get too many particles. I want to have a property that will limit the maximum amount of particles we allow in our game, so we can easily adjust that value if we need to. So inside update method on the main game class, in this section where we handle particles, I say if the length of particles array is more than 50, I want to slice the array and remove everything from 50 upwards. I do that by taking this dot particles and assigning it to the same array but sliced from index 0 to index 50. It will only allow the first 50 particles to be in this array, anything over and it will get sliced away. Slice method returns a copy of an array with only a portion of elements. From start index to end index we defined. The original array will not be modified, so that's why I'm overriding it like this, because in this case I want to modify the original array. So we have some hard-coded values repeated here and here. Let's replace them with a variable. I call it for example this.maxparticles. I declare it up here and I set it to 50. I can see it works because it slices particles from the array. You see how they disappear and we are getting gaps in our particle trail. 
I actually want to slice particles from the other side of the array. I want to remove the old ones, not the new ones. I can change the arguments I pass to slice method, or I can change how we push our dust and fire particles into particles array. In player states JS on line 104, instead of using push method, which adds one more element to the end of the array, I will use unshift built in array method instead. Unshift method adds one element to the beginning of an array. So now when I'm slicing from index 0 to index 50, I keep those new particles and I'm removing old ones if their index exceeds the value stored in max particles variable. I do the same thing on line 48. I will be unshifting dust particles, adding them to the beginning of our particles array. To check if everything works, I will console log this dot particles from here. It starts empty. If we start rolling, it fills with fire particles. If we run, it fills with dust particles. It never exceeds 50 particle objects, so our slice method is correctly limiting the length of the array. Nice! I'm on a strong computer, so I will set my maximum particle limit to 200, but you can keep it on a lower number if you want to, it's up to you. I will also delete this console log on line 57 to clean up. Congratulations on completing this lesson! In the next part, we will make our game look and feel better by adding more animation. It will help the player to get more visual feedback to the events happening in the game. I'll see you there!